This is Jeremy Clark of JeremyBytes.com, and today we're going to continue our look at C Sharp generics. This time, we'll be looking at nested generics. As a reminder, generics are classes, structures, interfaces, and methods that have placeholders, type parameters, for one or more of the types that they store or use. In part one, we took a look at using generics with collections, such as list of T. In part two, we created a generic interface, iRepository of T, T key. And in part three, we looked at generic methods. We created a get method that took a generic type parameter that would determine what kind of object it would return. Today, we're going to combine our generic method with our generic interface, and what we'll end up with is a nested generic. Now, the syntax is a little strange, and that's why we're spending a few minutes on this. And in previous segments, we've seen the benefits of generics, including type safety, performance, and flexibility and reuse. We're going to continue on with that and explore more of the flexibility and reuse. Now, if you remember, we originally started with a non-generic interface, iPerson repository, and we created a concrete type, Person Service Repository, that implemented that interface. Then all we would need to do is call the getPeople method to get a collection of person objects that we could work with. Now in part three, we created a generic factory method. With this method, we could say factory.get and then pass in the type that we wanted it to return to us. So if we say factory.get iPerson repository, it would give us a concrete type that implemented that interface. Now in the implementation of this method, we dynamically load something from the file system based on configuration. And then once we have that repository, we can call the getPeople method just like we did before. Now that's all well and good, but in part two, we took a look at making a generic interface. We actually created an iRepository of person string, and we created another class, generic person service repository, that implemented that. Now this interface has a getItems method, and in this case it would return us a collection of person objects. But what if we wanted to use the factory method just like we did in our previous example? Well it's actually pretty easy. We can use the same factory.get. Since it's a generic method, it will work with any types that we give it. But the question is, what do we actually use as the type for our get method? And it turns out this is not very difficult. When we use the non-generic interface, all we did was put that interface as our generic type parameter. Well, it turns out that we do exactly the same thing. So if we want an i repository of person string, we just use factory.get i repository of person string. Now this syntax does look a little strange, especially since we have those nested angle brackets. But once we look at the code, this will make a lot more sense. So here we are in Visual Studio. As a reminder, let's run our application to see where we last left it. So we have our non-generic list and our generic list buttons. Those are the ones we looked at in part one. And then we have our repository button. When we click this, it will get data from a WCF SOAP service and it will return the items to our list box. Now in this case, we do have a filter on this. So we're only getting the ones with the first name of John. So let's go back to our code. In our repository button underscore click event handler, we actually use the factory method we created and we're asking to get an iPerson repository. Once we have that, we call the getPeople method and then we for each over that to put the items into our list box. Now I'm gonna go ahead and remove this link condition that we had before. This way we'll get all of the items when we output our data. Now here we are using our non-generic iPerson repository. And as a reminder, this does not take any generic type parameters. But we do have another interface that we can use called iRepository. And this has two generic type parameters, T and T key. As a reminder, T represents our type and T key represents the type of the primary key. If we go to our repositories, we'll see that we do have one for a generic person service repository. And let's go ahead and collapse to definitions. 
and we can see we have a generic person service repository, which is an I repository of person string. So what if we want to use this in our factory method instead of the I person repository? Well, let's go ahead and make those updates. First, let's just comment out the section that we currently have, and then we'll add some new code. So we want an I repository of person string, and we'll call this repository, and we'll set this equal to factory.get, and then we do need some kind of type in here. Well, just like above where we took the I person repository and used that as the generic type parameter for the get method, we're going to take this I repository of person string and use that as the generic type parameter for the get method. Now notice we do end up with a nested generic here, but it's actually not too difficult to read if we start on the inside and work our way out. Inside the brackets, we have I repository of person string, the same type that we're asking for. And then if we move a step out from that, we can see that that whole thing is the type parameter for our get method. Now we do still want an I enumerable of person coming back called people, and we'll just say repository.getItems. So if we build at this point, we do get a successful build, but if we try to run, we'll actually get a runtime error. Now the reason for this is because our get method is expecting us to have something in configuration. Well, we haven't updated our configuration file, and so we're actually getting a null reference exception. So let's take a look at our code and see what we actually need to do here. Now as a reminder, the first thing we're doing is looking at the app settings in our configuration file. And in this case, we're doing a type of t.toString to figure out the key that we're looking for. So let's go to our app.config file. And if we look here, we have generics.common.interface.iPerson repository. This is actually the type that we were looking at last time. But now we're looking for an I repository of person string, which means we will need a different key here. And this is where things get a little interesting. First, let's go ahead and just copy and paste our previous value. Now, I'm not exactly sure what to put in here at this point, so we'll just leave it blank. Now, I do know I need to update the value so that it'll be generic person service repository and still coming from the generics.repository assembly. But how do we figure out this key? Well, let's see if we can set a breakpoint in here. So if we run our application and then click our button, what we actually want to know is what's the value of this two string? Well, unfortunately, this breakpoint really doesn't give us access to that. So let's modify our code a little bit. And what we'll do is actually break this out into a separate variable. So we'll create a string called generic name because that's the name of our generic type parameter. And we'll set it equal to this value. Then we can use that when we're looking in our app settings. So now let's run the application again and see what we get at this breakpoint. So we'll click the repository button, and now we can look at what generic name is. Now this looks a little confusing, so let's open it up in the text visualizer. What we see here is the fully qualified name of our generic type that we asked for. So we asked for an I repository of person string. Well, iRepository is in the generics.common.interface namespace, so we have generics.common.interface.iRepository. Now things start to get strange because we have a backtick two after that. What that means is there are two generic type parameters that go with this object. And instead of using angle brackets, we use square brackets. So inside the square brackets, we have the fully qualified names for our types generics.common.person, and system.string. This syntax is quite a bit different from what we use in c -sharp, but if we open up the IL that's generated when we compile the code, this is exactly what we'll see. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and copy and paste this into our app config. So we'll just copy this, and we'll stop debugging, and then we'll go to our app config, and paste this in as our key. And again, what we see here is the fully qualified name, generics.common.interface.irepository, 
back tick two, which again means we have two generic type parameters. And then inside the square brackets, we have our two generics, generic.common.person and system.string. With this in place, our application will be able to find this setting. So now if we run and remove our breakpoint and keep going, we'll see that we have the data coming out of our generic person service repository, the one that we're dynamically loading off of the file system. So we've seen two different things at work here. First, when we're using our factory.get method, we see that we have a nested generic. So inside the gets parameter, we have an irepository of person string. And the irepository of person string is the T that we want from the get method. Now in our get method, we didn't actually have to change any code in order to get this to work, but we changed a little bit of code to make it easier for us to debug and figure out what string we actually need. So if we want, we can actually put this back the way it was. So now we're just asking our app settings for type of t.toString, and our application will work exactly the same way that it did before. But the difference is when we split it out into a separate variable, we were able to inspect it in the debugger to find out exactly what string we needed for our configuration file. So sometimes being a little more verbose does make things easier to debug. So that's it for our quick look at nested generics. To get the downloads as well as the other parts of this video series, Check the links in the video notes. Next time, we'll wrap things up by looking at generic constraints as well as useful keywords such as default. Until then, feel free to visit www.jeremybytes.com for more information.